Got a nice power series ratio test, interval convergence. We got air derivatives, geometric series in here. You got the sum formula. This one's loaded up. So let's slow this one down. Let's spend a little time on this one. Let's make sure each part kind of makes sense in our head. There's most of my work and answers. And if I slide it up a little bit there, there's part B up there. It's a little messy, but let's zoom in on each part. Ratio test finding interval of convergence. This is just like our notes over our BC extra video lectures over the power series stuff. So we know the ratio test. We're gonna use this guy here. We're gonna do a lemma's n approach to infinity. We're gonna put absolute value bars around anything. We're going, to, we're going to replace all those n's with n plus one. That's a sub n plus one divided by the original, which means you're gonna multiply it by the reciprocal. The absolute value bars are gonna take care of those negative signs. And then you can rewrite that as x to the two n times x to the third, x to the two n times x to the first, the x to the two n's cancel. Everything else is gonna carry down. We pull out all of the non-n terms in front, keep it in the bars. You got the limits and approaches infinity of just that n stuff. The degrees are the same. So that's just two over two, which is one. And so you just got the absolute value of x squared is less than one. The nice thing is x squared is always positive. So you don't need those absolute value bars there. It's doing the same thing. So you just get x squared is less than one. This is a nonlinear inequality. So get everything on one side, zero on the right, factored it, find the zeros of negative one and a positive one. Use zero as your test point. Zero plus one is positive. Zero minus one is negative. Positive times negative is a negative. There's no even exponents for any double root. So the signs are going to alternate. And so you're looking for the intervals where it's less than zero. That's in between a negative one and the positive one. Now, anytime you get an open interval like that, this is everybody's favorite. We got to check those endpoints there. It's easier to check the x equals one, the x equals negative one. Looks a little bit weird at first there, but you're taking these x values of negative one and a positive one and you're plugging it into the original general term for that x value right there. So all that carries down and then that becomes negative one to the two n plus one. And notice how both of these are negatives. So you can technically add up those x points to get this negative one to three n plus one. And then just, just make sure this is an alternating series before you do the alternating series test right there. Like if you plug in n equals zero, that's gonna be negative one to the first, which is negative. Then if I plug in n equals one, you get negative one to the fourth, which is positive right there. So it is an alternating series. So technically you just carry that down, but usually we like to turn it into like negative one to the n or negative one to the n plus one. And I know I'm starting at zero on this thing because if I plug in zero here, negative one to the zero power is a positive number. If I plug in n equals one, negative one to the first is a negative one. And that first term is positive right there. So um, that's that. But so on this one, it, I'm either gonna use negative one to the n or negative one to the n plus one. It's usually what we turn that into. And I know that on this one, like that first term is negative. And so if I plug in n equals zero there, negative one to the first gives me the first term negative. Um, but the thing is that's an alternating series. So we're allowed to use the alternating series test. Now this part you can kind of do in your head, but the alternating series test, like we did earlier in the year is like, hey, that's the limits and approaches infinity of that one over two n plus one is equal to zero and the a sub n plus one. So if you replace an n with an n plus one, that's smaller than the a sub n. That's true since the two n plus three is greater than two n. You don't have to write all that down. Just kind of do that stuff in your head, write down what you need to there. But that when you prove that those two things are true, that's a convergent alternating series, which means that negative one, we're going to include the bracket there. Similar thing with x equals one, we just replace that with a positive one to the two n plus one. Now this time I'm not adding those exponents up because this is just one to a power. So that's just one. So the negative one to the n carries down, the two n plus one carries down. And then very similar work, we're gonna do actually the identical work right there. We're gonna do the alternating series. That's another converge alternating series. So they both converge. So which means that those two parentheses both turn into brackets there. So make sure you're checking your endpoints there and just practice that because we've seen that a bunch. All right, part B, when we start seeing this stuff here, subtraction, absolute value bar is less than something, that looks like that's an error problem where we look like the next term in that, that sequence right there. It's a little tricky because it doesn't really tell us how many terms we use or do we use two terms, three terms, whatever. But here's what I noticed, what we've seen on a bunch of other ones there. These terms here, it's an alternating series because the signs are switching. And those terms are decreasing in absolute value of zero, goes one third, one fifth, one seventh. So I'm just gonna jot that down. They like when we do stuff like that. Alternate, sometimes they just flat out tell us that, but here, if they don't tell us that, I'm gonna write that down. That's just, I'm telling them I'm allowed to use 
this alternating series earbound, which I could just look at that next term here. So the alternating series terms decrease in absolute value of zero. I will write that down. And then, so right here, this f of x, like the x is equal to one half. And notice if I plug in one half, I get one half for that very, very first term, okay? Um, so that was a little tricky there. They get that one half by plugging it into the, your power series. Um, and then that, they use just the first term right there. So when they say the error involved, you always look at the next term in the sequence that the error is less than the absolute value of the next term. And so then I'm still using the x equals one half, but instead of like the first term of n equals zero, I'm gonna use the second term, which is n equals one. And so, so basically you could just go into here or you could look at this guy right here, all right? So basically you just plugged in the one half, you got one half, that was your first term. So I'm going to the absolute value of this x cubed over three. Um, or you could plug it into this guy right here and put the air is less than the next term because the air, that next term represents the biggest that air could be up by. That's the biggest of the remaining terms. So the air is gonna be less than that. So I put air is less than the next term. So the air is less than, I'll plug in n equals one this time and um, the one half or the X there, or you could plug in one half right there and it's just gonna be the absolute value bars there. So we don't quite need that notation, but it's one half cubed over three, which is gonna be one eighth over three, which is one eight times one third, get that one over 24. So that is represented the error. So that error is less than that one tenth number right there. Okay, so just try to do something. If you see similar notation, we've seen notation like that before, just try to do something we don't. We've done a lot of stuff where we're just looking at that next term there. So we just gotta practice that. All right, letter C, write the first four non-zero terms in the general term of the infinite series that represents f prime of x. So if this is f of x, those are four terms. Let's just take the derivative of those four terms. So the derivative of that is one. Here, I'm gonna multiply by the power. The threes are gonna cancel, decrease the power by one. Here, same thing, multiply by the power. The fives will cancel, decrease the power by one. Carry the signs down, multiply by the power. The sevens will cancel, decrease the power by one. Those are the first four terms. They want that and also the general term, okay? It's easy to get the general term. This is the general term of your original problem for f of x. And I'm gonna take the derivative of that. Now notice, this is negative one to the m. This is two m plus one. That is like a fraction. Those are numbers, negative one to the n over two m plus one. That's a number in front of x raised to a power. So when I take the derivative of a fraction times x raised to a power, we're just gonna do our power rule to take the derivative. We're gonna multiply by the power so when I multiply by the power, the two to n plus ones cancel out. I just carry that down like I carry down a constant. So I multiply by the power, left the other stuff alone, decrease that power by one. So if I subtract one from that, I get x to the two n. So those cancel out. So this negative one n to the n x to the two n, that is the general term for your derivative right there. But you could always just take the derivative of that general term. All right, so make sure you get the four terms in that general term right there. Letter D, last part, use the result from part C to find the value of F prime of one six. So this is my F prime stuff right here. And I'm supposed to just take the one six and plug it in for those X's, all right? And it just keep, it does keep on going on forever and ever and ever and ever. It doesn't say use the first few terms right there because it just does keep going on. Um, but if I take one six and plug it in, I got one six squared, one six to the fourth, one six to the sixth. That's what's going on right there. So if you want the whole, the whole thing, the value of that, the meaning for us to kind of find the sum of that infinite series right there, which a lot of times it ends up being a geometric series. So you can actually find the sum using your A over one minus R formula. All right, so notice your first term is the one and then you're multiplying by a negative. If your signs alternate, your geometric series, your R value will be a negative number because when you multiply by a negative number each time, that's gonna cause the signs to flip. But I'm multiplying by one over six to the second each time. That's why I go six to the second, six to the fourth, six to the sixth. So your R value is negative one over 36. And then use your S equals A over one minus R because we wanna find the sum because it just keeps on going on forever and ever and ever. So they were nice of us to give us an easy geometric series at least. But then you do your A value, which is one, 
over one minus your R value. So one minus the negative one over 36 is gonna be plus a positive. And that's 36 over 36 plus one over 36, which is that. And then one over a fraction is the reciprocal of that fraction. So a bit of an intense problem. A um, lot of stuff in there, but a lot of stuff that we've also have practiced and we've seen a bunch of before. So just keep studying those and working at those and make sure you're trying all those on your own from scratch and keep getting better, better at them. And let me know if you have any other questions. Pumpernickel, pumpernickel bread. <laughs>